During the third week in Advent, we spend time thinking about joy. From Psalm 5, verse 11, we hear these words, But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing, let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them so that those who love your name may exalt you. Too often, we think of joy as something big, a brass band or a parade can certainly bring us joy just as easily and far more often we can feel joy in the hug or the squeeze of a hand. We can see joy in a smile or hear it in laughter. Help us to not overlook the simple joys that peek into our lives daily. This week in our Advent journey, open our eyes to the joy that surrounds us. Amen. I invite you to please listen as we share the message of joy. Welcome to our service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Nazarene Church here in Chetwin. Thank you for joining us today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we are once again being reminded by the season of the tremendous gift that you have given us. We thank you for your word that teaches and leads us through each day. We can have joy in our hearts because we know that someday we will be with you for eternity. Remind us always of your care and your power. Amen. Isaiah 65, verse 18. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. As you can tell now, as we look at the nations today, we aren't there yet. But this prophecy was given to Isaiah way back in the Old Testament, and the story of the Savior's birth was given to Adam and Eve way back at the beginning of time. Those long years between Adam and Eve and the birth of Jesus were years of both prosperity and joy and trials and tribulations. The nation was a motley crew and hard to handle. They didn't listen well and they weren't consistently obedient. So there were times when there was discipline. It all depended on how well they were listening to God. Does any of that sound familiar? I'm sure, since we've all been parents, we can recognize the pattern. How every, however, every step of the way, God was with them. There were times of encouragement and there were the prophets who reminded them of who he was and who they were supposed to be. The prophet Isaiah was one of those prophets. No, the world at the time of Jesus was not a peaceful place. It certainly wasn't perfect. When we sing Silent Night, their world was still not very silent. This unique nation that God was creating was under the rule of a Roman Empire. They were under the thumb of a cruel and harsh leader. Yet that is the moment that God sent his son. We turn to Galatians 4, verse 4 to 7. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. He sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. But when the right time came, for centuries, the Jews had been wondering when their Messiah would come. Sometimes they were patient, and many times they were not. But their timetable wasn't important. This was God's timing. It's always difficult waiting. But what is important is what we do as we wait. As we move toward Christmas, we have looked at hope, and last week we looked at peace. What is the purpose behind the celebration of Christmas? For those who are in Christ, Christmas lies solely in the birth of Christ. Luke's account of Christ's birth is more than a heartwarming story or a call to blind faith. It's true. It's historical and life-changing. It is good news, and it brings great joy to a world darkened by sin. 
Luke 2 tells us that Mary and Joseph went from Nazareth to Bethlehem so they could register as the law required. While they journeyed, Mary, who was pregnant and pledged to be married, was married to Joseph, gave birth to a baby. There was no room at the inn, so she gave birth to her baby in a barn, a man-made manger, because there was no other place for Joseph to take his wife. Why did he come? Why the Son of God would come to this world to live and then die, and then miraculously be resurrected to become our Savior? After you look deep in your soul, Christmas is about Jesus. You take Christ out of Christmas and you just have gift giving. The joy of the Lord comes from choosing the Christ child like the shepherds did, experiencing Christmas. They were there. Luke 2, 8 to 20. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast hope of a host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. After seeing them, him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angels had told them. The shepherds were just doing their thing, living life with all its ups and downs, just like we do every day. The shepherds were not the most liked people in the area. They were considered unclean by the priests and not allowed to go to the temple. However, they were the first who were given an opportunity to experience Christ fresh and new on that monumental night. <coughs> Angels light up the sky in the fields. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Can you picture that? The good news, which is really great news, is that all of us who have heard the good news has an opportunity to do like the shepherds in the field. Verse 15, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Each one of us this morning, right now, has a choice whether we will receive that good news and do something with it or ignore it and make today just another day. The way things were then and the way things are now haven't changed in one respect. The Lord is speaking, and we have a choice of whether we will be listening. You and I are getting a chance to change destiny. That destiny can be changed because of the Christ child, Jesus. For, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Hope is not an absence of problems, but joy, the greater joy, the good news of the gospel, the joy that the angels proclaimed is not a thing, but a person. Lasting joy comes in the hope and the peace of Almighty God and can be had no other way. Let's take a minute and look at the joy of the Lord and the joy of the world. The joy of the world. In most surveys taken, the most important thing to most people is themselves. Then family, jobs, relationships, fut the future, all fall into the first five places depending upon who you're talking to. Joy to many are things that are temporary. They are willing to give up long-lasting eternal things 
for things that last only a while. Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Our joy should not be based upon what we're going through. It is based upon what Christ has already done for us. It is based on the fact that this is not all there is. And the Lord, as Savior of our life, has secured our future and is bright and is beyond comprehension and is not ever to be in doubt. Now back to those closing verses in verses 16 to 20. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a manger after seeing him. The shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. It's interesting to note that the very first visitors that the Christ child had were the so-called unclean shepherds of a herd of sheep. It wasn't the heads of nations. It wasn't the priests and the prophets. It was the common, everyday person living a life filled with drudgery and hard work. It's also interesting to note their response. The first thing they did was to tell everyone about the experience. Then, as the dust settled down, they went back to their flocks and praised God. They were convinced. But the history of the world doesn't end there. Christ's mission was not complete. His future was filled with difficulty, with betrayal, and with the cross looming up on the horizon. But even that was not the end of history. There were, was more to come. The prophecy given to the serpent that he would be destroyed has not yet come to pass. We battle with those forces every day. However, we too can hold fast to the prophecy of Isaiah as we read in the Advent reading and in the beginning of this message. God is still in the business of creating, and this is the reason for our joy. Because of Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, we have this promise to hold on to. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will freely give from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. So hang on. It may be a bumpy ride, but we know God's promises are true. As I close, it is my prayer that each of us would experience the joy of the Lord, the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit to give us strength and peace that only God can do. <coughs> Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we continue to go through the Christmas season, remind us daily of your love and mercy. Bring true joy to the lives of those who look for you. Open hearts and minds to find that joy and the love and the promises that you have given. Help us to respond like the shepherds to a world that desperately needs you. Thank you. Amen. Hello and welcome to this worship service. My name is Carmen Little and I'm a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry. It is my pleasure to worship with you today. This new day is fresh with possibility to encounter the living Christ. With bright eyes, let us search. This new day is fresh with possibility to understand the living Christ. With engaged minds, let us ponder.
This new day is fresh with possibility to be moved by the living Christ. With compassionate hearts, let us feel. This new day is fresh with possibility to respond to the living Christ. With solid devotion, let us follow. This new day is fresh with possibility to serve the living Christ. With humble intention, let us act. This new day is fresh with possibility to praise the living Christ. With strong voices, let us sing. We open in prayer. Merciful God, give us the same attitude as Jesus, who emptied himself and was obedient to you all the way to his death on the cross. Make us eager to put others before ourselves and their needs before our own. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. What is a generous person? A truly generous person does more than string together a few generous acts. A generous person lives a lifestyle of generosity. A lifestyle is defined as the habits, attitudes, tastes, moral standards, and actions that make up a person's manner of living. Additionally, a lifestyle of generosity is about a lot more than money. In fact, money is only a small part of a lifestyle of generosity. Instead, a lifestyle of generosity is living, thinking, and acting for the benefit of others before oneself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. A generous life may involve money, but it does not have to cost a dime. The man who most demonstrated a life of generosity was Jesus. His life reflected the generosity of the Father, which far exceeds anything we can ever do. Even if we can't live up to that standard, we can recognize his generous nature and his selflessness. Because he lived so generously, we can say, see ways we can do better. Jesus gave of himself to everyone, even the smallest and the weakest. In Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Matthew 15 has two wonderful examples of the generous and compassionate heart of Jesus. He heals the demon-possessed daughter of a Canaanite woman. He feeds the 4,000. Time after time, he healed, fed, and loved people. He lived a lifestyle of compassionate generosity, even without having any assets or financial wealth. There was no profit for him in either act of generosity and service, just a blessing to those who received. Of course, none of us can feed thousands or heal without money. We are short of the power to perform miracles in the same fashion that Jesus did. But we can be part of a miracle of generosity and compassion when we live a life of generosity. To live a lifestyle of generosity, we give of our labor, influence, financial resources, and expertise. We see generosity in healthcare professionals traveling on mission trips to give labor and expertise to the poor who have no access to healthcare. It can be seen when a busy business person gives financial resources, even when there is no available time to give his or her labor. However, these are only the most obvious examples of lifestyle generosity. In actually living a lifestyle of generosity, the possibilities are endless as the creative minds of people who care enough to get involved. A lifestyle of compassionate generosity is filled with service and mission. What does it mean to live generously? Living generously means living as an open or empty vessel. You allow the characteristics of God to flow in and through you so that God is glorified, others are blessed, and you too are blessed. Living generously is living open-hearted. 
To live open-hearted means your heart is in tune with and living for God. God is open-hearted. His love is unconditional. His arms and heart are open to all who would receive him. Living open-hearted means being compassionate and having God's heart toward people and situations. When you are open-hearted, your heart is open to what God wants to do in and through you. Living generously is living open-minded. To live open-minded means your mind is set on Christ. Your mind is renewed by the Word and not conformed to the Word's narrative, to the world's narrative, which results in being closed off to what God wants to do through you. The Bible says that as a Christian, you have the mind of Christ, which means you can see and think about people and situations like Christ does. Living open-minded means getting rid of any pride and adopting a position of humility. Living generously is living open-handed. To live open-handed means that whatever you own does not own you. You are willing to part with things that rust destroys or thieves could steal if it means blessing someone else and bringing glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, God may have given you abundant resources, wealth, or talents, which are there for you to manage. But as soon as they start managing you and your desires above God's, you are no longer living for God. Living open-hearted, open-minded, and open-handed are characteristics of living generously. Paul reminds us to be living generously. As Paul visits the church in Ephesus, he reminds them about his faithful service and urges them to follow his example of serving the Lord with all humility. He warns them about false teachers and encourages them to sacrifice worldly gain to bring others to Christ. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20, 35. God is generous. He gave his son because he loves us and wants us to have eternal life. He is a God of abundance, not lack. He loves a cheerful giver because he is a cheerful giver. He is not tight-fisted, but generous and abundant. Psalm 104 speaks about the abundance, mercy, and loving kindness of God. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. When we are living generously, we reflect his nature. Living generously for God's kingdom expands the gospel. New people and places are reached with the good news of Jesus. There are practical ways of expansion from new buildings to new ministries. There are also spiritual, relational, and emotional ways of expanding the kingdom of God. When we are living generously, God's love and mercy are expanded into our families, friends, workplaces, and beyond. When someone who doesn't know Jesus walks into a new building, has a conversation with a Christian at work, or is served through a ministry, it's an opportunity for God to expand his kingdom. This was made possible because someone chose to live generously. When we are living generously, we expand the kingdom. Others are blessed. A small gift brings greater awareness to the need. A small donation is like a seed planted that begins to sprout and take root. It creates a greater awareness of others and their needs, which blossoms into compassion and generosity. God's Word tells us that He is our provider. He gives us all that we need, and His heart is to have us share with others. Our sharing plant seeds. Awareness of needs and meeting them is a godly characteristic. When we see a need and choose to live generously, we reflect the heart of God. As a result, we encourage the faith of those who know Him and display the love of God to a watching world. When we are living generously, 
we have a greater awareness of needs. As we become more aware of the need, there are more opportunities for the Holy Spirit to work in someone's heart. Living generously allows revival and redemption to enter the scene and lives are changed. If you've ever been given a gift that brought you to tears, you know the emotion that comes when receiving it. Whether the gift is practical, like a box of food for a needy family, or encouraging, like kind words after a rough day, living generously blesses others and creates opportunities for the Holy Spirit to work in hearts. When we are living generously, the Holy Spirit has room to work. We are blessed. The Bible says that when we have much, it is tempting to let the much control us. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. When you choose to give what you want to hold close, it frees you from strongholds like greed and selfish ambition that only leave you unsatisfied. Strongholds hold us back, consume our thoughts, and hinder us from stepping into what God has called us to do. But operating out of the spirit to give rather than the flesh to hold tight frees us from that stronghold. When we are living generously, we are freed from strongholds of greed and selfish ambition. And as you are freed from the stronghold, you begin to see beyond your desires and into eternity. Our flesh is limited. It only sees what it can see in the natural earthly realms. But God's word tells us to set our minds on the things above. When we give and invest in the kingdom's mission to make the love of Jesus irresistible, our hearts and minds are fixed on God. Our priorities are aligned with his, and all the things that used to consume our thoughts and minds begin to fade, and we can begin to see lives changed by Jesus. Prayerfully consider how God wants you to live generously. The enemy will always tempt you to hold on to things. Holding on to earthly treasures gives him opportunities to put you into a stronghold. But you don't have to give him those opportunities. You can choose to live generously, resisting the flesh and walking in the spirit. Consider the blessings of living generously. God is blessed. Others are blessed. You are blessed. Each blessing gives further depth to how God, others, and you are blessed through giving. And now let us, God's people, pray. Holy Lord, our God, you exhort us to love our neighbors as if they were ourselves with every action of our lives. Expand our willingness to see each other and ourselves as the living temples of your spirit and grace by following the path of your commandments. O Christ, our sure foundation, incline our hearts to your teaching. Holy Lord, our God, infuse the marrow of every leader and member of government throughout our world, our country, and our community with the ethical intent to do justice, to have mercy, and to govern with compassion, working together according to your way. O Christ, our sure foundation, incline our hearts to your teaching. Holy Lord, our God, ease the distress for those who are sick, injured, or afraid, and for those who selflessly aid and comfort them. Holy Lord, our God, soften the grief for all who are bereft as your glorious gates receive our faithful beloved, now joyfully alive again with you for all eternity. O Christ, our sure foundation, incline our hearts to your teaching. O God of grace and glory, be ever constant in your presence and keep us ever faithful to our soul's foundation. Guide us toward having the charity of heart and the strength of character to be as giving of our love as we are eager to receive it. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.